Hi, so today we are going to learn about the use of cyclosporin in dermatology. So cyclosporin comes from the soil fungus Tolipocladium inflatum gams. So earlier in the in 1960s to 80s, people were searching for an antimycotic agent, and the and from this fungus they isolated a compound known as cyclosporin, and they found that cyclosporin was a very bad anti antimycotic. It was not a good antimycotic, but it had good immunosuppressive properties. Predominantly, initially it was used for psoriatic arthritis and it was found to be very much useful. Now cyclosporin has two forms and these are the forms in which it is manufactured. One is sand immune. Sand immune comes from Sandoz laboratories in USA where it was first isolated from Tolipocladium inflatum and neural which is the newer form. Okay, neo means new. Okay, so new oral form. Now a new, new oral or neural has some pro particular properties. For example, it is a pre-digested form. So it's a pre-digested form and it is less dependent on bile, food, diet or gastrointestinal mucosa for absorption. Okay. It is more bioavailable. It is more consistently absorbed and it is the only form of cyclosporin which is FDA approved for psoriasis. So we need to remember that this, this, is, this is a good viva question that it's the only form of cyclosporin A which is FDA approved for psoriasis. Now the oral solution is diluted with other things like orange juice, apple juice, milk and chocolate milk. So these four things have been mentioned in various books which you can use to dilute the oral form and uh, consume it. So just remember this thing that it is isolated from Tolipocladium inflatum gams which is a soil fungus. It's a good quiz question and two forms sand immune and neural and these are the properties of neural. Okay. Now what cy uh, cyclosporin is, it's a calcineurin inhibitor. So calcineurin is, a, is, is responsible for translation of various interleukins, predominantly interleukin 2 pathway. So interleukin 2 is predominantly secreted via the calcineurin pathway and what cyclosporin does is it inhibits the calcineurin. Now good thing about cyclosporin is that it is it is not cytotoxic, it does not suppress the bone marrow and it is not teratogenic. Remember when we were studying azathioprine and methotrexate, both of them uh, were cytotoxic, they led to cell death, they, they used to suppress bone marrow and they were teratogenic. Cyclosporin is, uh, does not show any of these properties. Now bioavailability for sand immune it is around 30% and neural is 10 to 54% more than sand immune. So it is not 10 to 54% absolute. It is 10 to 54 percent more than sand immune. The peak plasma levels are reached in 2 to 4 hours. It is 90 percent protein bound and half life ranges from 5 to 18 hours. So, roughly about 5 to 18 hours, the half life is of cyclosporin, and the peak plasma levels are reached after oral consumption is 2 to 4 hours. One point to remember is that neo oral has 10 to 54 percent more bioavailability as compared to sand immune. Now, cyclosporin is a very highly lipophilic, that means fat loving molecule. 80% of the molecule is bind to lipoproteins and it has a poor blood brain barrier penetration. Okay, so it is available as, as an IV, oral agent, and also topical agent. Predominantly, topical agents are used in ophthalmology. The percentages range from 0 to sorry, 0.05% to 2%. So these are various forms of ointments available predominantly in ophthalmology and there have been studies to show a good effect of topical uh, eye ointment of cyclosporin in patients of Steven Johnson syndrome to mitigate the eye damage in SGS. Okay. Now empiric dosing. Empiric dosing for sand immune is 2.5 to 5 mg per kg per day. And as we know that new oral is 10 to 54 percent more, 10 to 54 percent more bioavailable as compared to sand immune. So the empiric dosing is a bit less, 2.5 to 4 milligram per kg per day. This we are talking about for dermatological indications. For rheumatology, the uh, empiric dosing is somewhat towards the higher side. But remember, for sand immune, it is it is 2.5 to 5 mg per kg per day, and for new oral, it is slightly less, 2.5 to 4 mg per kg per day. 
in pediatric population the empiric dosing is 5 to 7 mg per kg per day and this higher dosing is because there is a higher renal clearance of uh, cyclosporin so in children in pediatric population since their kidneys are able to easily clear out cyclosporin the dose per day is a bit higher to 5 to 7 mg per kg per day now it is extensively metabolized by cytochrome p450 enzyme of 3a4 that this is very essential let me just write it properly mm -hmm. cytochrome p450 3a4 type okay so it is metabolized by this cytochrome enzyme and one good point to remember is that grape, uh, sorry, grapefruit, grapefruit and grapefruit juice are a good inducer of cytochrome enzymes, this, this particular enzyme. And because of that, you do not mix cyto, uh, grapefruit to oral cyclosporin preparations. Otherwise, it will lead to uh, increased metabolism and decreased, uh, decreased levels of cyclosporin. So you can use uh, orange juice, apple juice, chocolate milk and milk to dilute oral suspension but grapefruit and grapefruit juices is a strict no-no. So what happens to cyclosporin after absorption is that it, it gets excreted via liver. It gets converted. Uh, it, is, it attaches itself in bile and through coprobilinogen, it, it, it is excreted out of the body through the feces. A little person, roughly around 6% is excreted via the kidneys. Okay. So, one thing to remember is in a patient who does not have a proper functioning liver, the dose adjustment has to be done. While a proper functioning kidney is not particularly required for cyclosporin, not much dose changes are required. Okay. Now, in short, we learn about the major mechanism of action, how does cyclosporin acts in the body. So this is the this uh, flow chart is the normal mechanism. What happens uh, in uh, in the body is that an antigen is presented by antigen presenting cell using the MHC2 pathway. The comp it forms a complex, and this complex is, is recognized by various T cells via the TCL receptor. This leads to T cell activation, and this activation downstream leads to calcineurin activation. Now this calcineurin. And calcium is one of the cofactors for, for this action. This calcineurin activates nuclear factor activated T cells. Now, what NFAT does is it leads to downstream increased production of interleukin 2. So, increased production of interleukin 2 happens. <coughs> now, increased interleukin 2 along with increased interleukin 2 receptor leads to a positive feedback. That means interleukin 2 increases its own production. So, interleukin 2 increases the own production by acting on the calcineurin pathway and the cycle keeps on compounding and it leads to a cascade which is predominantly utilizing interleukin 2. <coughs> now what cyclosporin does is it inhibits calcineurin. Okay. Uh, as we know that tacrolimus and pimicrolimus are also a group of calcineurin inhibitors. Predominantly, we use them in dermatology as a topical agent, but cyclosporin is used in topical oral and uh, IV agent. So, they inhibit calcineurin and because of that, the NFAT gets decreased. Because of that, the interleukin 2 gets decreased. So, predominantly, the most, the major pathway for cyclosporin activation is interleukin 2 reduction. Okay. So what happens is that cyclosporin it binds to a complex with cyclophilin and this both of them together for example this let's say this is cyclosporin okay and this is cyclophilin so cyclosporin and cyclophilin you can remember that cyclophilin cyclolover so cyclosporin cyclophilin forms a complex and this complex then goes and binds to calmodulin okay uh, and this cal and uh, the deactivation of calmodulin leads to decrease and fat which leads to decrease interleukin 2 and because of that there is decreased activation of cd4 cells there is decreased activation of cd8 positive t cells so your t cells show decreased activity because of cyclosporin additionally there is decrease in interferon gamma and interferon gamma decreases icam1 now the major uh, function of icam1 is to attack is for the attachment of inflammatory cells to the walls of blood vessels now what happens is let's just say these are endothelial cells 
and you have a inflammatory cell and it has to squeeze through it so if we can just make like this yeah so if you remember your pathology this process is known as diapedesis okay so this attachment is is done by ICAM1 and when this ICAM1 is decreased because of decreased interferon gamma <coughs> there is decreased migration of inflammatory cells through the blood vessels towards the skin so there is less recruitment of inflammatory cells at the skin Additionally, there is also decreased keratinocyte proliferation, which you will see because of its, uh, which will be, which you will see because of its action on psoriasis. Additionally, it binds to steroid receptor associated heat shock protein number fifty six, and this leads to additional decrease in others interleukins like one, three, four, five, six, eight, and TNF alpha. So one, three, four. 5, 6, 8 and TNF alpha and we know that interleukin 2 is also decreased. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 and TNF alpha. Other mechanism of action is that it, it inhibits histamine release from mast cells and we can the clinical significance is it's the it's used in urticaria. Okay. Now what are the major indications or the uses of cyclosporin? What FDA has done is it has approved cyclosporin to be used in psoriasis and it has only mentioned predominantly three indications. If it is severe psoriasis, so it has to be severe or it is recalcitrant not responding to other treatment therapies, sorry other therapies or it is extensively disabling psoriasis. For example, hand and foot psoriasis not allowing the patient to work properly or any other cause of disability and you should also remember that psychosocial disability is also included in this okay <coughs> in other countries now fda is for us okay fda is for us other countries predominantly in europe it has also been approved for atopic dermatitis atopic dermatitis but that too in severe cases and also not responding to other therapies and just to manage the acute flare-ups in atopic dermatitis we will discuss it in further slides now other dermatological uses which are and all others are off label that is off fda label and again you have to remember that we just have to know the headings so papulosquamous dermatosis like lichen planus Bullous dermatosis like pemphigus, pemphigoid, epidermolysis bullosa equisita, linear IgA, granulomatous disorders like granuloma annula, sarcoidosis, disorders of keratinization like PRP, photosensitive dermatosis like chronic acting dermatitis, autoimmune connective tissue disorders like dermatomyositis, LE, scleroderma, eutrophic dermatosis like Bechet's, pyoderma gangrenosum. Dermatitis, as I have already uh, told you, that it is one of the indications in Europe, in European countries, alopecia areata. In other dermatoses, few of the important examples are morphia, prurigo, and uh, reactive arthritis, sclermic edema, SGSTN. Now, SGSTN is a very significant indication. We'll discuss that in uh, next slide. Urticaria is one important indication of cyclosporin, of off-label indication. And additionally, there's one more thing which is missing, which I would like to mention is vitiligo. We'll discuss where it is used in vitiligo. Now, uh, in atopic dermatitis, what happens is that it is in Europe, it is approved for use of atopic dermatitis. Along with that, in pediatric cases, in childhood atopic dermatitis, cyclosporin is one of the first line drugs to control acute flare-ups. The side effects like headache, abdominal pain uh, are most commonly seen. In adults, the, one of the most common side effects is nausea, vomiting, followed by nephrotoxicity and hypertension and dyslipidemia. But in pediatric population, headache and abdominal pain are most common side effects. In pediatric population, it is less nephrotoxic as I've already told you that there is increased clearance of cyclosporin in ch childhood. So it's less nephrotoxic and thus it causes less hypertension which we usually see in adult population. In pyoderma gangrenosum, the effect has found to be similar to prednisolone with fewer adverse effects. Okay. In chronic idiopathic urticaria, predominantly patients who have failed antihistamines or omalizumab, these are good 
candidates for using cyclosporin in sgstn syndrome so in europe in european guidelines cyclosporin is one of the first line drugs however the latest concept is that you might try conservative management in mild to moderate sgstn initially we had prednisolone in india a lot of areas do use prednisolone so another immunosuppressive drug instead of prednis prednisolone uh, sorry prednisolone is cyclosporin so cyclosporin has found in comparison with prednisolone is to it reduces mortality that's one of the effects and as and i've already told you that in, in ophthalmic indications eye ointments in the range of 1% to 2% have been used to decrease the morbidity related to corneal damage in sgsten now in alopecia areata it has been found to show better results when it is combined with topical corticosteroids in bachet's refractory eye disease uh, and refractive mucositis are the areas where cyclosporin has shown good effect so predominantly eye involvement and mucosal involvement are the indications for using cyclosporin in lichen planus it has been shown that it decreases pruritus and the on, and the action is roughly less than 2 months so less than equal to 2 months the pruritus gets significantly decreased and there is a very quick response in resolution of lesions the only issue is that after stopping cyclosporin there are high relapse rates so you have to keep that in mind now in vitiligo it has been found that post nces or any vitiligo surgery uh, let's say this was the involved area now this is depigmented macule and you provide suspension to it after treatment it leads to a halo so surrounding area might get a bit depigmented maybe because of activity of uh, vitiligo around about surgery or that area has not taken the graft properly so it has been found that starting cyclosporin either one week before surgery or just after the surgery has been shown that the chances of post surgery halo around the treated area is less so remember that we very frequently use tacrolimus which is another calcineurin inhibitor sorry which is uh, another um, calmodulin calmodulin inhibitor so we can also use cyclosporin in this indication also specific indications for cyclosporin psoriasis so we'll just discuss use of cyclosporin in this setting of psoriasis patients with severe flare ups so if you have a patient who has a severe flare up and requires an an agent which can handle the acute increase in disease activity cyclosporin is a good option patient with severe or disabling psoriasis who cannot tolerate or have any other contraindications to other therapies so if you have a patient who is not able to tolerate other therapies or is not responding to other therapies or uh, has contraindication to other therapies cyclosporin is a good agent so remember that cyclosporin is not particularly teratogenic so in patients in which you cannot use methotrexate or azathioprine cyclosporin is a very good option to control acute flare ups in psoriasis now third indication is that patients who are having major life events for example a wedding or they have to attend a family function and there's an acute flare up psoriasis and they need something to control that flare up for a short duration of time very fast cyclosporin is a very good indic uh, very good agent to be used in that scenario so what cyclosporin does is it's a bit faster acting as compared to other modalities and the effect is significantly uh, attained with cyclosporin the only issue is that uh, the disease tends to flare up after cyclosporin is so not flare up but rebound after cyclosporin is stopped so it's a good idea to start cyclosporin control the disease activity acutely and then maintain the patient in remission using other drugs like retinoids or methotrexate or biologicals in psoriasis okay additionally you should know that fd has approved cyclosporin for use in psoriasis till around 1 year duration that means cyclosporin should be used for one year and then you have to think about other drugs because prolonged use of cyclosporin has been associated with increased malignancies and other adverse effects like irreversible kidney damage so fd has said that one year is around about the same time the world guidelines say that you can extend the duration of treatment to two years but you should always remember that cyclosporin is a very good agent to control acute disease activity and then we have to maintain the patient using other drugs okay 
So it is mentioned here that in each of these indications, cyclosporine therapy should be given for three to six months, ideally 12 months at most. So as per FDA, it is one year. But as per world guidelines, you may extend to two years depending on clinical response and side effects. Clear? Few extra points are that if in psoriasis, uh, you don't have a good response at 5 mg per kg per day. And this is we are talking about sand immune. Okay. If it is neural, so 4 mg per kg per day. If there are no side effects, you may consider extending till 5 mg per kg per day. But if there is no response till 3 months at high doses of cyclosporin, stop the drug. That means it is not working. Stop the drug. Okay. Talking about sequential therapy. Now, I have already mentioned that cyclosporin is a very good agent to control disease activity in the acute stage. So, you control the acute flare-up and then maintain the patient using using other agents. So if the agents in question is acetretin or any other biological, it is known as sequential therapy. This term was initially used for acetretin. Now it includes biologicals also. It has three stages, stage one, stage two and stage three. Stage one is when you use only cyclosporin to control acute activity to, of the disease. Stage two is when there is an overlap between cyclosporin and acetretin or biologicals and in which the other agents take care of psoriasis so that we can taper and stop cyclosporin A and third stage is the final stage in which you maintain the disease remission with acetretin and biologicals sorry acetretin or biologicals other agent could be PUVA but you have to be very careful in using PUVA because prolonged PUVA exposure predominantly around 150 to 200 sessions cumulative has shown to increase chances of uh, non-melanoma skin cancers in patients. Now another term that I have come across is rotational therapy in which cyclosporin A and methotrexate are the two drugs which are used. You control acutely with cyclosporin A. Then you have a brief overlap period with methotrexate and then you maintain the disease in remission using only methotrexate. Okay. So just remember that for acute cyclosporin A, for chronic, rem for chronic remission, other drugs like acetretin, methotrexate or biologicals. Now rotational therapy with cyclosporin A initially then an overlap with cyclosporin A and methotrexate and then maintenance on methotrexate has been FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis. So for RA, FDA has approved this combination. If your patient is obese, you have to use ideal weight. Uh, there is a formula for ideal weight. I think for males it is 55 kg plus point. Uh, 2.3 or some kg kg per inches above 5 feet so it's a very complicated formula just remember that if your patient is obese you have to use ideal weight for calculation of dose of cyclosporin cold turkey stopping that means stopping at once do not uh, without tapering has been found that it leads to rebound of disease so whenever you're planning to decrease cyclosporin a good idea will be to decrease by 0.5 mg per kg per two weeks So this is one of the uh, one of the terms that I've found in various articles that you should decrease uh, after you have maintained after you have attained remission in acute stages of disease. You would decrease cyclosporin by 0.5 mg per kg every two weeks till you taper it off. Okay, because if you stop suddenly, there will be a higher chances of rebound of the disease. This is again sequential therapy. Phase 1 is the clearing phase in which you take care of the acute increase in activity. You use only cyclosporin. Phase 2 is transition phase in which you shift cyclosporin to other agents like acetretin or biologicals. And phase 3 is maintenance phase in which you use only acetretin or biologicals to take care to maintain the disease in remission. So just to recap that cyclosporin initially then both of them together and then only acetretin or biologicals to be used. It has further been uh, divided into 3A and 3B. 3A uses only acetretin, 3B uses acetretin along with UVB or UVA which is known as Repuva. Re for retinoids and Puva, so Repuva. But again a word of caution, a, a word of caution that using Puva with cyclosporin has been found to be increased, link, uh, increased 
linked to skin cancers so you have to be a bit careful while doing so contraindications like all drugs hypersensitivity is a contraindication so either you are hyper either the patient is hypersensitive to cyclosporin or any components of formulations so these are contraindications for that malignancies like non melanoma skin cancer and some lymphomas are a contraindication prior radiation therapy because prior radiation therapy has also found to increase the chances of malignancies so they are they are also a contraindication abnormal renal function or uncontrolled hypertension we know that cyclosporin leads to or may lead to hypertension in patients so if you if your patient already has uncontrolled hypertension not responding to routine you routinely use anti hypertensive agents it's better not to use it concomitant uva or methotrexate or other immunosuppressive increases the chances of infection so it's better not to use also in, uh, using puva and metho also leads to increase in chances of lymphomas and other non melanoma skin cancers so we have to be very careful and it's better not to use cyclosporin in that scenario box warnings are that it should be prescribed only by clinicians who have experience in using drugs now if you read the chapter on cyclosporin and valvertin you will find that the authors keep on pushing the idea that cyclosporin is a good drug and people don't use it because they are not aware of the side effects and i somewhat agree to it it's a very good and fast acting drug it's very safe drug as long as you know the side effects and drug interaction since it is metabolized by cytochrome p450 it is a drug which is li liable to a lot of interaction from routinely used drugs we will discuss those interactions in subsequent slides but if we have a some general idea it's a very safe drug to use okay so you need to be experienced in in the use of this drug bioavailability varies so you have to keep that in mind there's also uh, so we have already discussed that sand immune and neural are two forms there's also a cyclosporin modified form which is somewhat similar to neural so these kind of formulations are differ in biological sorry bioavailability so you have to keep that in mind sometimes a patient might have started sand immune form and you need to convert to neural it's better to decrease the dose to 50% to 75% of the sand immune dose because we know that neural is much more bioavailable 10 to 54% times so we need to decrease the dose hypertension we have already discussed nephrotoxicity yes it leads to kidney damage malignancy risk in transplant patient now remember that nearly all immunosuppressants have initially been used as a drug to prevent rejection after transplant so same is the case for cyclosporin and uh, we should remember that in cases of uh, rheumatological diseases or transplants the dose dose of cyclosporin which is used is a bit relatively higher and they have been uh, reported risk of carcinomas in those patients but for dermatoses like other immunosuppressive drugs the dose used is less so you one must be cautious about it but the risk of malignancy has been found to be nearly similar to background population now psoriasis patient have an increased risk of skin malignancies because a lot of them have undergone undergone a lot of phototherapy uh, and also using using methotrexate with cyclosporin we have already discussed that it leads to increased chances of malignancies and also other biologicals remember three important reasons in which there can be increased side effect with cyclosporin one is using other immunosuppressive agents like other biologicals second is prior use of methotrexate third is prior phototherapy so in patients who have psoriasis these three are the indications in which you might have a lot more side effects with cyclosporin you have to keep that in mind other warnings are infections like serious bacterial viral fungal infections which of course being an immunosuppressive you have to keep in mind malignancies we have already discussed in details metabolic like hyperkalemia increased potassium hyperuricemia and hypomagnesemia remember that it increases potassium decreases magnesium okay increases uric acid so hyperuricemia is has not been found that prevalent in lower doses increased potassium you have to keep in mind that it may lead to hyperkalemia and uh, cardiac arrhythmias and other disorders because of that and decreased magnesium 
it is nephrotoxic especially in higher doses so you have to adjust cyclosporinated doses hypertension can be seen and that is predominated predominantly due to renal involvement so we know that uh, when blood flow to kidneys is reduced and gfr glomerular filtration rate is reduced it leads to increased blood pressure by the renin angiotensin mechanism and other also other mechanisms also and this will lead to hypertension in your patients so you have to keep that in mind so other nephrotoxic drugs if your patient is taking other kidney damaging drugs you have to be very cautious about using cyclosporine and may need to adjust the dose higher doses can lead to transaminitis and hepatotoxicity so you have to keep that in mind also if the liver is already damaged it's better to use lower doses of cyclosporine now it is pregnancy category c c for cyclosporine c for pregnancy category c this is the older category after 2015 we have been using newer category so newer is probably compatible okay that's how the newer categories are they are more descriptive they don't use one letter so initially it was c now it is probably compatible now adverse effect of cyclosporine i have found that it's better to remember cyclosporine by going from head to toe makes it easier to remember so gradually and slowly we will discuss the various adverse effect of cyclosporine starting from the topmost area which is neurological so neurological side effects are tremors headache and paresthesia and hyperesthesia it is usually seen in 7% now remember this percentages are a rough estimate of different articles one book mentions 7% uh, they have been of course variation so just keep in mind the relative frequency of adverse effects so 7% of patients uh, show neurological effects and it is most commonly seen when you use cyclosporine for less than 2 months it is reversible on discontinuation that means if you stop cyclosporine this neurological side effects tend to go away and sometimes it has been seen that it may improve on continuation okay so if it is mild and you keep on giving cyclosporine if it becomes worse it's better to stop and if it is mild and it is improving on its own in spite of the patient being on cyclosporine you continue the drug okay regarding the mucocutaneous side effects of patients who are on cyclosporine two major side effects which we will discuss now are hypertrichosis and gingival hyperplasia now gingival hyperplasia or gum hyperplasia is seen in around 12% of patients on cyclosporine they it can be easily prevented by having a good dental hygiene and also using topical or systemic azithromycin or metronidazole now gum hyperplasia is a significant side effect with cyclosporine other drugs which may cause gum hyperplasia which we have discussed previously is nifedipine and also phenytoin so remember that phenytoin uh, it has a significant drug interaction with cyclosporine and nifedipine has side effect profile same as cyclosporine so we need to be a bit sure when uh, when a, when our patients might be taking multiple different kind of drugs hypertrichosis or increased hair growth is seen in 24% of patients who are taking cyclosporine and they have to be physically uh, dealt with either with shaving or waxing the hair off or other destructive modalities like rfa uh, rfa destruction of hair follicles one thing to be keep kept in mind is that hypertrichosis with cyclosporine is reversible on discontinuation that means if we uh, discontinue the drug if we stop cyclosporine the hypertrichosis tends to revert back so we need to counsel the patient that if the hair growth is not significantly hampering the daily life or having any kind of psychosocial impact on the daily life of the patient it will go back to its normal self when cyclosporine is stopped gastrointestinal adverse effects now uh, it is usually seen in around 9% of patients and if you continue the uh, drug continue cyclosporine the adverse effects may improve most common symptoms sorry most common adverse effects are gi side effects predominantly nausea abdominal discomfort and diarrhea and if it, if you are using the oral suspension and you dilute it using various materials that we have previously discussed like milk chocolate milk uh, orange juice apple juice the palatability or the acceptability of cyclosporine significantly improves so uh, nausea and abdominal discomfort is reduced to somewhat extent 
transaminitis is one important side effect that you need to take care of increased liver damage of uh, it is mostly seen when cyclosporin is used for a prolonged duration there is rise in otpt level and the barrier or the threshold that i particularly use is that if otpt rises to more than two times the upper limit it's a good idea to reduce the dose by 25 percent per week till the otpt returns to normal so if otpt is increased sgot sgpt on repeat evaluation is found to be increased to more than twice the upper limit it's better to reduce cyclosporine doses by 25 percent per week till the otpt comes back in range and then you can take a call whether to continue with cyclosporine or use uh, another drug uh, drug altogether okay now hypertension hypertension is a very important side effect on cyclosporine it is one of the most common side effects uh, as a clinician that we face while using cyclosporine increased blood pressure is very frequently seen with cyclosporine so you need to be on lookout uh, lookout for increased blood pressure Primarily, it is because of vasoconstriction in the, in the kidneys. Okay, so because of vasoconstriction, it leads to reduced blood flow or decreasing glomerular filtration rate, and in turn, as we know about kidney physiology, it leads to increased blood pressure. Roughly about 27% of psoriasis patients who are taking cyclosporine face increased blood pressure, and for that, we need to have repeated blood pressure measurements. The hypertension is right now described as more than 140 by 90, more than 140 mmHg systolic, more than 90 mmHg diastolic. So if any one of those values is more than the uh, baseline, it's called hypertension. Now treatment for hypertension is, of course, the first answer would be lifestyle modification and diet. So diet and lifestyle modification are the first step. If that doesn't work, then the treat drug class of choice is calcium channel blockers, CCBs. Wolverton mentions two calcium channel blockers, one is nifedipine and the other is isradipine. Now nif nifedipine has an additional side effect of gum hypertrophy, which we see in cyclosporin also. So it's better to use isradipine so that the side effect profile does do not overlap. Uh, if that is not possible, then nifedipine is good enough, but you need to keep an eye out on gum hypertrophy. One thing to keep in mind is that diltiazem and verapamil should not be used as they alter the cyclosporin A level because of the interaction with cytochrome P450 enzyme. So because these uh, two drugs, diltiazem and verapamil, they interact with the cytochrome P450 enzymes, it's, it's advisable not to use it. They increase cyclosporin A levels, may lead to toxicity of cyclosporin, additional toxicity. Other than that, we know that in increased use of cyclosporin leads to hyperkalemia. So potassium sparing diuretics should not be used. Now, it's mostly the other way around that patient is already taking some antihypertensives and you started cyclosporin. So, it's a good idea, number one, maybe not to consider cyclosporin in those patients. But number two, write a short note to their cardiologist or their internist that they should consider changing the class of drugs to manage hypertension. Okay. Number three would be to alter the doses of cyclosporin depending on drug interactions and uh, make sure you do repeated monitoring so that you're on top of things. One of the most side effects, oh, sorry, one of the most important side effects of cyclosporin use is its uh, adverse effect on kidneys. So this is one of the major side effects and as a practicing physician, you should know about it, uh, how to alter the doses. And additionally, as you're, as during residency, it's a very good viva question. How would you alter the doses of uh, cyclosporin if your patient has renal dysfunction? Now, renal dysfunction has, is, has been described as of two types. One is primary, which occurs initially in less than three weeks, in the first two to three weeks of using cyclosporin. It's because of direct nephrotoxicity of the drug and it is reversible. So, uh, we can say that in kidneys, the cyclosporin directly damages the kidney and this leads to primary type or type 1 of renal dysfunction with cyclosporin. Secondary type is chronic subclinical. So, chronic means over a prolonged duration of time and subclinical means that laboratory parameters are not deranged, they are only slightly deranged, but that slight derangement is for is over a long period of time and that is, that is leading to renal dysfunction. Now, what are this, uh, this uh, damages to the kidney? So, it is described to have interstitial fibrosis of the renal parenchyma and tubular atrophy. So, these two things occur over a prolonged duration of cyclosporin use and this makes the kidney damage irreversible. 
you have to keep in mind that primary type is reversible, secondary type is irreversible, and this happens over a prolonged duration of cyclosporine use. Additionally, your patient might be taking other drugs which are nephrotoxic, so keep that in mind that uh, because of different drug interactions and the adverse actions of different drugs on renal parenchyma can lead to an irreversible damage over long term. So, we have to keep that in mind. Now, this is one of the important flow chart and a good viva question on how to tailor your cyclosporine doses in patients who are showing renal dysfunction on laboratory parameters. So, let's say you have started cyclosporine in a patient and you have you're keeping uh, the you keep monitoring creatinine levels. Assuming that creatinine levels increasing by increases by 30%. So keep that in mind that some of the guidelines mention 50% rise from baseline, some mention 25%. So these are different guidelines, okay? 25% is also okay, 50% is also okay. 30% is what is international, internationally accepted as a good cutoff. So if creatinine level rises above 30% of patient's baseline, 30% of a patient's baseline, you repeat the measurement within the next two weeks. If creatinine is still above 30% of the patient's baseline, you reduce the dose of cyclosporine A by 1 mg per kg per day and you keep that reduced dose for at least a month. After that you repeat again, if creatinine goes below 30% of, of, of the baseline, you may consider using, the, using cyclosporine at the same low dose, the low dose which we had initially done. If creatinine still remains above 30% in spite of using low dose for one month, you have to stop cyclosporine treatment. You have to stop it. Now, creatinine will return to around 10% of patient's baseline. So, of course, it is because of uh, the cyclosporine-induced nephrotoxicity. So, if you have stopped cyclosporine, the creatinine levels will gradually decrease. And when it comes within 10% of baseline, you can take a call whether to restart cyclosporine at a lower, lower dose or consider other drugs. Okay? So, just to summarize that, for example, uh, this is the baseline and this is 30% from baseline and this is 10%, okay. So, if cyclosporine is more than, more than 30%, you repeat again after 2 weeks. After 2 weeks, you repeat again, okay. After 2 weeks, if it is still high, you decrease cyclosporine doses. Till it comes, decrease cyclosporine dose for a month till it comes below 30%. Okay. If it is below 30%, you can continue the cyclosporine at the reduced dose. So, reduction is by 1 mg per kg per day and you have to keep it reduced for a month. If it is still above 30%, you have to stop the treatment and wait for creatinine levels to go below 10%. And when it comes below 10%, you can consider using either cyclos sorry you can consider using cyclosporine at a low dose or you may consider other drugs and do not use cyclosporine so i, I hope i have made myself clear if it is more than 30% repeat after 2 weeks if it is still more than 30% you reduce the dose keep it keep it at low dose for one month measure again if it is now less than 30% continue at lower dose or stop if it is more than 30% you stop Wait for it to come below 10% of baseline, then consider either using it again or switching to a newer drug. Clear? So, if that concept is clear, you'll be able to answer your questions in Viva. Additional, if additional side effects like myalgia, lethargy, arthralgia have also been described, the musculoskeletal side effects of cyclosporin. Discussing briefly about laboratory anomalies, one of the most common anomalies is hyperkalemia, so increased potassium, sorry, increased uh, potassium is seen, increased uric acid, hypomagnesemia, hyperlipidemia. So out of this, you have to keep an eye on potassium and lipids. These are one of the few, one of the uh, laboratory parameters that are deranged in, uh, earlier. Now. Uh, we will discuss up slightly in detail about hyperlipidemia. Uh, now, these kind of laboratory derangements are common. 
and if you find that on repeated evaluation your patient has increased lipids step one is always diet and lifestyle changes if it is still not responding you may consider starting statins but you have to keep in mind that statins like lower statin simvastatin atorvastatin the levels of these three statins are increased by cyclosporin a and because of their increased levels it leads to increased side effects okay so because of increased levels of these statins there is increase in side effects predominantly rhabdomyolysis and you must remember in previous slide where we, we were discussing that muscle pain myalgia arthralgia are also seen with cyclosporin so increased statin side effects are seen however statins like fluvastatin rosuvastatin pravastatin are found to be safe they don't interact with cyclosporin or cytochrome enzymes okay so most of the time the situation is is somewhat reversed patient is already on different statins if the patient already has hypertension their uh, their cardiologist or internist might have started uh, the statins it's a good idea to always ask the patient what all medications they were taking and it's uh, you just have to write a short note that for a particular indication let's say psoriasis i wish to start cyclosporin it reacts with one of the statins and might increase its dose so it's a good idea to either switch to fluvastatin rosuvastatin and pravastatin or maybe consider other methods of uh, lipid management okay just to recapitulate that fluvastatin rosuvastatin and pravastatin found to be generally safe uh, with uh, safe in their use with cyclosporin <laughs> one additional adverse effect that we would like to discuss uh, is malignancy now we have to say uh, we have to, we have found that non melanoma skin cancers and lymphoma incidences are seen at towards the higher side as compared to baseline population but remember that these kind of side effects with immunosuppressive agents have been reported in organ transplant patients in which the dose of cyclosporin is usually more more than 5 ranging to 5 to 7.5 mg per kg uh, per day in dermatology we use a bit lower doses but still you have to keep an eye out for non melanoma skin cancers and lymphomas it is most commonly seen when the dose when the duration of cyclosporin therapy is more than 2 years uh, if the do, if the uh, if let's say the duration of therapy is less than 1 year and you suspect that patient has lymphoma many of the lymphomas show regression after stopping cyclosporin so FDA has approved the use of cyclosporin to maximum of 12 months and worldwide guidelines say that that duration can be extended to 2 week 2 years so keep that in mind that cyclosporin should be used to control acute flare ups of disease in a, a short duration and then maintain using other drugs so you don't necessarily consider using cyclosporin for longer duration if you use it for longer duration incidence of malignancy increases other risk factors are prior use of puva So remember that more than 200 sessions of puva has been linked with malignancies in the isolated case studies so that risk is present and additionally if a patient who has been exposed to uv radiation uva or uvb radiation of more than 200 for more than 200 sessions you make sure in every repeated operative visits we examine and the risk for malignancy is taken care of in repeated visits prior radiation therapy so most of the time the patient with cyclosporin in its initial stages were being used for organ transplant patients and radiation therapy uh, is mostly used in organ transplant if you want to you know ablate the bone marrow so prior radiation therapy is also a risk factor concomitant immunosuppressant use like methotrexate so in, uh, so use of methotrexate along with cyclosporin may increase the chances of developing malignancies so just to recapitulate more than 2 years of use use with methotrexate and other immunosuppressant prior puva and prior, prior radiation therapy so these are the risk factors which may increase a patient's chance of developing non melanoma skin cancer and lymphomas now drug interactions cyclosporin has multiple drug interactions because it is metabolized by cytochrome p450 enzyme it is very tough to remember we just have to look at one of the some some of the major drug interactions which include antibiotics like erythromycin clarithromycin antifungals like etoconazole etroconazole 
So these are CYP inhibitors and in, by inhibiting cytochrome B450 enzyme, they increase cyclosporine A levels. So just to, just to recapitulate, that cytochrome P450 is necessary for metabolism of cyclosporin and because of just a second and because of that when these when cytochrome enzyme is inhibited it will lead to increased cyclosporin A levels okay so all the drugs which inhibit cytochrome P450 enzyme increases cyclosporin A levels leading to toxicity and these drugs include ketoconazole Deltiazem, ciprofloxacin, ritonavir, grapefruit and grapefruit juice, dinosaur, lifampin, phenytoin. See, this kind of drugs, uh, this, this list of drugs is very difficult to remember. That's understandable. Nobody remembers it. I don't remember it. It is easily, you can easily Google and find out. But it's better that you have to ask whether your patients are taking other drugs for any other indication so that you rule out interaction of those drugs with cyclosporin. Clear? Additional interactions with amino glycosides because they are potentially renal toxic and uh, uh, we have to be very careful while using with cyclosporin which can itself cause renal damage. Other important nephrotoxic drugs are amphotericin B, NSAIDs. So we just have to be, uh, be continuously monitoring renal levels by using creatinine levels, GFR levels. Uh, potassium excretion, potassium levels, and all that. Other immunosuppressants, which uh, which we have already mentioned, that methotrexate increases malignancy chances. Biologicals increases prolonged immunosuppression. Okay. Drugs that can increase potassium most commonly are the antihypertensive drugs, which are potassium potassium sparing diuretics, ACE inhibitors, ARTs, potassium sparing diuretics, potassium supplements. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, vaccines we'll discuss in the last slide just one line on when to give and when not to give. Concomitant use of corticosteroids like dexamethasone and methylprednisolone, these are SIP substrates and can increase the cyclosporin drug levels through unknown mechanisms. So we have to make keep that in mind that using cyclosporin with steroids. Now, what are the indications of using cyclosporin with steroids? Uh, Maybe during pustular psoriasis in pregnancy or generalized pustular psoriasis, or if you're using it to um, control a severe activity of idiopathic urticaria, or maybe during stress when you're shifting from high dose systemic steroids to cyclosporin. So keep that in mind that the drug levels of cyclosporin may be increased by concomitant use of bisalone. Now, just some additional points that while using vaccines with any immunosuppressive agents, live vaccines are contraindicated. It is preferable to give killed vaccine, but remember that killed vaccine response may be attenuated. That means it will be decreased. So whenever we give a killed vaccine or let's say a subunit vaccine, we need to have a good working immunity for good seroconversion. So seroconversion means that antibodies to that specific pathogens are formed. The antibodies that we are supplying through vaccination are recognized by the cells and those cells start producing good amount of antibodies. Clear? So for that you need to have a good working immune system and this immune system are, is being suppressed by using cyclosporin and the other immunosuppressive agents. So killed vaccine response might be decreased. So if you are planning to vaccinate a patient and patient is on cyclosporin, a good idea would be to stop cyclosporin two weeks before vaccination. If a patient has just received vaccination and you want to give cyclosporin, it's a good idea to wait for four to six weeks after vaccination to start cyclosporin. Clear? So one of the most important lines is this one, just the second point. Okay. So if patient is already on cyclosporin, stop it, wait for two weeks, give vaccination. If patient has taken vaccination, wait for four to six weeks and then start cyclosporin. Now in oral solution, you have to mix and drink immediately for it to be uh, significant, uh, properly absorbed through GIT. Oral solution is not refrigerated and use has to be within two months of opening the bottle. Okay. It's, it's, an, I, it's a good idea to counsel your patients to use contraceptives 
and it is described in books to be used for uh, the entire duration of treatment plus additional 12 weeks after stopping okay so uh, it is cyclosporin is a safer drug as compared to methotrexate or azathioprine uh, as we have already previously mentioned that it is not teratogenic but it's a good idea that patient, if the patient is taking any kind of immunosuppressives uh, most of the immunosuppressive have a tendency to cross placenta and most of the immunosuppressives are in pregnancy category C or D apart from methotrexate which is category X remember that so cyclosporin has been associated with prematurity and low birth weight in isolated case reports so that kind of theoretical risk is still there so it's a good idea to ask them to observe contraception with two different modalities for the entire duration of therapy along with additional 12 weeks now cyclosporin is released in breast milk so it is to be avoided during in lactating mothers so that's an additional uh, additional advice that you have to give So uh, with that, I'll end my presentation on use of cyclosporin in dermatology. We have to keep in mind that cyclosporin is a good drug. Given that, you should know about the finer intricacies, the finer delicate, uh, sorry, finer delicate points in using cyclosporin. It's one of those drugs that does act quickly. Uh, the safety profile is significantly uh, easy, can be easily measured by routine blood investigations, and it has shown to have significantly good effects in the various dermatoses so it's it's a good idea to know about these kind of interactions the only problem is that it has a lot of interactions with other drugs because of its metabolism by cytochrome p450 so with time and with usage you might be able to have another good drug in your arsenal to treat various dermatoses so with that i'll finish the presentation if you have any doubts and clarifications or any suggestions you can email me at this id Otherwise, you can just comment below the video and I'll, I'll just have a look at it. If there are, are any other questions which you uh, which you have been asked during Viva uh, in relation to cyclosporin and you don't know the answer, just share with me. I'll try to find out even if it, it will increase my knowledge while searching for it. So, uh, I hope this presentation was useful. Okay, thanks.